and it's very much tongue in cheek. I don't want to offend my my Jewish brothers and sisters, and so and that's, that's not my intention. I we love them and and we take them very seriously, but but anyway, <laughs> uh, seems there, there there was this journalist that um, got assigned to Jerusalem to uh, to report what's going on in Jerusalem, and so he gets sent there and he gets set up in an apartment. And uh, this apartment happens to be overlooking the Wailing Wall. Are you familiar with the Wailing Wall? The, the old uh, um, Orthodox Jews go there and they, and they pray and they, and they cry out and, uh, and things like that. And so after several weeks of watching what goes on at the Wailing Wall, he notices this, this elderly man who, who's there every day. Every day at the same time, kind of leaves for a little while at the same time, comes back. And he's there all day, you know, just praying at the Wailing Wall. And so the journalist, of course, he's up there for stories. He wonders, well, maybe there's a story in this. And so he goes down to, to see the old man, and, and he begins to engage him in conversation. And so um, he says to him, he introduces himself, and he says, you know, you, you come I see that you come to the wall um, every day. What are, you, what are you praying for? And the old, the old guy replies, well, what am I praying for? Uh, in the morning, I pray for world peace. And then I, then I pray for the brotherhood of man. And then I go home and I have a, a glass of iced tea and I come back and I pray that all sickness and illness would be eradicated off the face of the earth. And you know, the journalist is taken by the old man's sincerity, especially his persistence. And he, he says, do you mean you've been coming to the wall every day for these things? The old man nods and he goes, how long have you, have you been coming to the wall? He thinks for a minute, goes, oh, I guess going on about 20, 25 years. And the journalist is amazed. He goes, how does it feel to come and pray every day for over 20 years for these things? How does it feel? And the old man replies, he goes, it feels like I'm talking to a wall. <laughs> 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 we know that we have God's ear, don't we? Through faith in Jesus Christ, we know that, uh, that Jesus Christ has paid the admission to our presence into the throne room of heaven. It's the Holy Spirit that comes and ushers us into his presence. And it's important, and the Holy Spirit is so vital to our lives. And uh, part of the reason for our little series uh, here over the next few weeks is just because I think there's a, a lack of understanding, a lack of a appreciation for um, who the Holy Spirit is in relationship to the Godhead. He is part of the Godhead. And when, who, when we talk about the Godhead, we're referring to who? We're, we're referring to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What we, what we call, what the scholars call the Trinity. And this is, uh, this is um, 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 laid out for us in Scripture without that name on it. But we s constantly see in the New Testament uh, uh, the writers referring to the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and Jesus, you know, teaches us that they are in fact one. And we're, this is what we're going to look at again this morning a little bit. Um, who is the Holy Spirit? Well, last week we began to answer that question, and we need to understand that the Holy Spirit is a unique person in the Godhead, and we refer to Him as a person. Why? Because the Scriptures declare that He has emotions that he can be grieved, that he can have joy, and, and, and those, are, those are personality traits. That, uh, and so we see the Holy Spirit as a person. And so many times the Holy Spirit's been referred to as an it, taking away his, his, his pers personhood. And so we want to we remember as we, we walk with the Lord, that as we are upon this earth, that we are actually walking with the Holy Spirit. It's Holy Spirit that is guiding us and directing us. And, w and while this is maybe a little hard for us to wrap our, in our finite minds around, it's no less true. And, and hopefully through, uh, through the, the, the teachings over the next couple of weeks, we'll, we'll come just a little bit closer of understanding the fullness of God, who He is, and the Holy S who the full Holy Spirit is in our lives. So the Holy Spirit is a, a unique person 
not merely a power or an influence that, that emanates somehow from God or, or through a relationship with Jesus, but the Holy Spirit is in fact God. The Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. This is, what we ref- this is who and what we refer to as the, as the Godhead. The Holy Spirit is the author of truth. We, we understand this by what's been written in the New Testament. We, 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 we understand that the writers of the Bible were, were carried along by the Spirit as they wrote scriptures. And, and we're going to read some scripture today that kind of in, where Jesus seems to indirectly point to this in his, in his statements as he's leaving the earth in, in John 14. We also understand that the Holy Spirit is in fact creator of life. We read in, in, in the book of Genesis that, that, that God had formed man out of the dust of the ground and, and breathed life into his nostrils. And so he's not only, and, 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 in, the, and in the New Testament, in the, um, under the new covenant, he's, he's also the creator of life in that we were born again. We go from, from, from being the, the walking dead, so to speak, to being alive in Christ, being born again. But the Holy Spirit has been a flashpoint among believers in the church simply because of unbiblical beliefs about him. These unbelif- unbiblical beliefs cause confusion and even fear at times. But as we look to the scriptures regarding the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, confusion can be replaced by clarity. And rather than fear, we can confidently embrace the Holy Spirit and experience him in all of his fullness because he is to be experienced as well. The Holy Spirit is vital to us as believers and we see from scripture that Jesus himself was dependent upon the Holy Spirit. He was was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He was empowered by the Spirit at the River Jordan, and he did no miracles until he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Listen to John's testimony of Jesus. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified, this is the Son of God. John the Baptist, the forerunner forerunner of the Messiah, was told at some point you were going to actually see the Spirit of God come and rest upon the Messiah. This will will let you know even further that this is in fact the Son of God. And John says, that I was told that, that came to pass, and I'm testifying to you that this is he, that this is he. And so as we look at, at Scripture here this morning, and I want to remind you that I'm going to be bouncing around a little bit. I want to encourage you to, to grab a piece of paper in front of you and, and a pen and maybe take some notes at least regarding the Scripture references. So as we look at the, uh, our first uh, Scripture here, we're looking at John 14 and 10 and Jesus says do you not believe that I am in the father and the father in me the words that I speak to you I do not speak on my own authority but the father who dwells in me does the work can you see the language there the I in the father and the father in me describing for us what we refer to as the Godhead that they're, 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 they are separate, but yet they are one. And, and again, I understand this is a little hard for us to wrap our minds around sometimes, but that doesn't stop it from b- b- making it any less true, amen? And so, um, so do you notice here that Jesus is referring to the Holy Spirit as his Father? Um, this isn't a problem. Remember what the angel said to Joseph? He said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And so we see the Holy Spirit and the Father being tied together here, if you will, if that's an appropriate way to to, uh, describe it. Based on this, it would make sense that Jesus would refer to the Holy Spirit as the Father who dwells in me. 
And again, pointing to the fact the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one. During his time on, on earth, Jesus and the Holy Spirit always worked together. And we see Jesus affirm this for us in John 5, where we read, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing by himself. We see the dependence on the Father and the Holy Spirit here. I, the, son, he, the Son can do nothing by himself, but what he sees the Father do for whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. If the Son of God needed this ongoing partnership with the Holy Spirit, how much, you know, to complete his work, his mission upon the earth, how much more do you and I need him? How much more would you and I need him? The, ho the, the Holy Spirit to do what God has called us to do as individuals and, and what he's called us to do corporately as a congregation. We need the empowerment, the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We have a glimpse We've been given a glimpse of, of the relationship between Jesus and the Holy Spirit, but what about the relationship between the Holy Spirit and the believer? What did Jesus have to say about that? What did Jesus have to say about the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives today? Well, let's look at John 14 again. We read that if you love me, keep my commandments. This is the Lord Jesus talking. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Jesus says, I'm leaving, but I'm not leaving you. I will come to you. Notice before Jesus speaks of the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit's assignment is, he reminds us to recognize his supreme authority. He says, obey my commands. Recognize his lordship, placing emphasis on our obedience toward him and keeping his commands. Peter confirmed this truth also when he said, we are witnesses to these things. And also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those whom what? who obey him. And so God gives the Holy Spirit that those, to those who are obedient to him. And I want to just maybe go out on a limb here this morning that, that God gives um, the Holy Spirit in greater measure to those who are obedient to him. Um, I think that um, um, I'm just going to stop there. I'm going to take a chance on that one that we, as, as we grow in greater obedience to the Lord, he's able to come in and take more control over our lives and, 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 and fill us in greater ways so we can be used more greatly by him. Um, the, the I want to look at the word another. He said, uh, I'm gonna, he, he will give you another helper. And uh, in the Greek, there is, uh, in the New Testament rather, there is, uh, another is uh, translated two ways. There is heteros, who means another of a different sort. And there is alos, who means, that means another of the same kind. Another of a different sort, another of the same kind. So what, are, what am I trying to say here? That if you were eating an apple, and you finished the apple, and I asked you if you wanted another piece of fruit, and you said yes, and I gave you an orange, that would be heteros. Okay? I've given you another piece of fruit. Apples and oranges are both fruit, but I've given you another of a different kind. You're eating an apple. You finish the apple and I said, do you want another piece of fruit? And you say, yes, I give you an apple. That's aloes. Jesus is using the word aloes here. Another of the same kind, not of a different sort, but another of the same kind. Jesus was saying, the Father will send you a helper just like me. In other words, Jesus... And the Holy Spirit, again, are of the same kind. They're, they are God. He said, I will send you another helper. I want to look at the word helper here. The word helper is translated parakletos. And parakletos is a compound of two words. Para, meaning very close. And kaleo, that means to beckon or call. So there's a, the, he's, he's come to be very close to us, and that's his calling. That Paul used this same word when he says, I've been called as an apostle to the Gentiles. It's his, it's calling, his, his beckoning, his mission. And so that's how we get that word. He says, I'm a call to be an apostle to the, to the Gentiles. And again, that word kaleo invokes the idea of action or destiny. 
And so what does this mean to you and I as believers, as, as followers of Christ? Well, the Holy Spirit is permanently called alongside each of us to provide counsel. There's a new word in our that we throw around quite a bit, and I'm going to use it this morning, to provide counsel, coaching, to coach us along the way, to, for, for direction, for instruction, you know, to help us uh, uh, on our journey home and our journey through this life, not just to complete a mission, but he's with us all the way home. And, and, as, and as I um, studied on this this week, I, I wonder not if, what I wonder how the, how the relationship with the Holy Spirit will change once we enter into eternity. I think it's going to be one of greater familiarity with him, you know. Um, I think it's going to be uh, more intimate, it, you know, and constant rather than maybe the, the intermittent um, experiences and, and relationship that we have with him now. You know, and I don't, I, you know, I'm, I'm guilty of this. I, I think of the Lord Jesus all the time. Uh, but it's the Holy Spirit who's with me. It's the Spirit of Jesus who's here with me. It's the, Spirit, it's the Holy Spirit who guides me in my study time. It's the, the Holy Spirit who helps me in every aspect of my spiritual life and in even my natural life. Jesus is in heaven at the right hand of God. Why, again, I'm going to ask the question, why does not the Holy Spirit get more attention from us? Why isn't he referred to more and acknowledged more in our prayer time? Yeah. So the Holy Spirit is called along each side of us, and, and Jesus said the Holy Spirit will abide with us forever, and, and that, that's what prompted that, that question about eternity, how that um, um, relationship with the Holy Spirit will um, transition as well. He's going to be there. I'm just, you know, what that looks like for us, I guess, is kind of a, a uh, red herring kind of thought for this morning. <laughs> I'm going to try to just leave it there. But uh, Jesus said the Holy Spirit will abide, abide with us forever, continuing on the work of Jesus in our lives, the work that Jesus started in our lives. Uh, again, how sad it is that the Holy Spirit is rarely honored or, or even mentioned in churches or, or by believers. And, and I ask us all this morning, how often do we go through an entire day without saying one word to the person who's actually walking with us? You know? Um, or worse, treating the Holy Spirit, treating Holy Spirit like something other than He is. You know, some kind of influence or some kind of power, mysterious power that emanates from God. No, He's, he's, a, he's a person in the Godhead. As we continue to look at the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, we read in Proverbs 20 and 27, the spirit of a man is the lamp of the Lord, searching the inner depths of his heart. The spirit of a man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the inner depths of his heart. We have a lamp in our house at home, and it's not on right now. The sun shines out, and and for it to come on, we need to turn on a switch. There needs to be power that goes to it to light up, okay? So it is in the life of the believer. Proverbs is not saying that we all have that light, that we're already lit, but that we're a lamp. That doesn't mean you're, you're, you're emanating light just because you're a lamp. That doesn't mean you're lit because you're a lamp. But we are lamps of the Lord. And what Proverbs is saying is that we're spiritual beings and we either emanate light or we don't. And until we are born again, there's no light in us. We, we're, we, there's no light in us. And Jesus was referring to believers and believers only when he says, you are the light of the world. And he, and he encouraged us not to leave our, let, put a basket over our light. You know, he said that, you know, people don't light a lamp and then put a basket over it or stick it under a bed. They put it on a prominent place in the house. And as followers of Christ, we want to we wanna expel that light into the world around us. But the Spirit gives life, and Jesus said you must be born again. So the Spirit gives life, and it gives life. No life, no light, <laughs> okay? We need, we need God, the Holy Spirit, to even be brought to the Son of God. We, we prayed that in that manner this morning, that we remember that, that, the Father, that Jesus said nobody comes to me unless the Father draws them. And it's a, our salvation is a work of God from beginning to end. But... And in addition to all of this, apart from the whole Holy Spirit 
There's no spiritual learning. The Spirit and the Word are intertwined together. And if anybody anybody comes comes and says they have a word, the Holy Spirit's given me a word, or I have a, a word from God, all of these things need to dovetail together. The, the, the word needs to uh, 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 be in line completely with the word of God. No variation or, or at all in that. It needs to line up with the word of God. The, 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 the word that they might give us might paraphrase, but it's got it's, it's to gotta line up with the word of God or it's godless. The, the 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 you know it's of the word and the word of God is of no private inter, uh, interpretation either. It means one thing. As we go through the Bible, uh, and so apart from the Holy Spirit, there's no spiritual learning, and the Holy Spirit does not speak out of outside what is contained again or in line with the written word of God. Listen to what Jesus says in in, in John 16, when he, excuse me. I don't, that's not what I'm going to read here. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. Again, that's John 16, 13. Sadly, for many, when we think of the Holy Spirit, we think of, uh, again, we think of an entity apart from the Godhead. We think of an entity apart from God the Father and God the Son. And when we do this, we actually can be driving a wedge between the Holy Spirit and Jesus who, who, who in fact have had a, a very intimate relationship while he's a, you know, upon the earth. And we, we can, when we think in terms of the Holy Spirit, when we, when we um, try to operate in the gifts of the Spirit, we can be guilty sometimes of, tr- of being, becoming obsessed with trying to tap into some kind of spiritual pizzazz, if you will. We start, we start looking for emotional experiences and that's not to say that we can't or we shouldn't seek to experience the Holy Spirit, experience the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. We want to see, see God come in here like he did in the Old Testament with a cloud and, and everybody be on their face and experiencing the presence of God. That Yes, let's Lord come and, and do that. But then there's the day-to-day things that we, we, we need to look to the Holy Spirit for as well. There are manifestations of the Holy Spirit. There is giftings of the Holy Spirit. But what we need to understand is those kinds of things actually represent a very small fraction of what the Holy Spirit's all about. Of what the Holy Spirit's all about. So the Holy Spirit ministry in the Word, if you have your Bibles, uh, we looked at uh, John 13. Let's, let's learn uh, sk- 16. Let's look at John 16 real quick in our Bibles because I, I haven't put these up for you. And we're in um, John 16. And we're going to read uh, beginning at um, verse 12. He says, I still have many things to say to you. This is Jesus speaking. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you the things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. So remember the Holy Spirit is just like Jesus. He teaches like Jesus. He's here to guide us into truth and understanding. Jesus was a great teacher. You know, he says here, I still have many things to say to you. And I'm wondering if Jesus was admitting that his own teaching was incomplete. Hear me closely now. Incomplete that he wasn't finished. He had more things to say to them. And he, he was by no means done teaching. And I think he anticipated further instruction through the writing of the Holy Spirit. You know, through the, through the authors of the Holy Spirit, you know, the, the, the gospel writers and, and Peter and uh, um, um, Luke and, and so on. But the statement um, of Jesus certainly um, encourages confidence 
and the inspiration of the New Testament, does it not? Kind of bouncing back to where we started this little section here um, about uh, understanding and guiding truth, we look at uh, 1 Corinthians again. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 6. And this is Paul writing, of course. And he says, However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature. We speak wisdom about the, those who are spiritually mature, the, who understand. We speak this about those who get it. Yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, not worldly wisdom, not what the, not what the president is telling us. I got nothing against the president, you know, but the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. But we speak wisdom of God in a mystery. Now remember that word mystery when we use it in the New Testament is not that like a whodunit. But the word mystery when it's used in the New Testament is something that was, was obscured but now has been brought to light. That, that, that now that's been uncovered. We, we, we speak to these things that God had concealed for a while but now they've been revealed to us and we're sharing that with you. That's where, when we, so let's, the word mystery the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the, the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. Had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But it is written, I has not seen nor heard nor entered the heart of man the things which God, which God has prepared for those who love him. You ain't seen nothing yet, Paul's saying. You got no idea the things that God has for you, not only upon this earth, but in the, in the age to come, in the kingdom of heaven, in eternity. You have no idea. But God has real, revealed them to us through his spirit. Here we're back to the Holy Spirit again. And Jesus saying, I had much, much more to teach you. I have much more to say to you, but you can't bear it now. And I truly believe this is, this is right where Jesus was going. Paul understands this, and Paul's relating this again, affirming um, what Jesus has said, or, or commentating on what Jesus said, I guess would be a better way of, of uh, putting it. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of a man which, in him, which is in him? Nobody knows what I think better than me. Nobody knows, you know, and even that's kind of frightening sometimes, you know. <laughs> and I'm glad you don't know what I think sometimes. <laughs> I'm glad I know what you don't think sometimes. But uh, even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God, okay? So now we have received not the Spirit of of the world, but the Spirit who's from God that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. We need the Spirit to understand God. We need, to underst we need this Holy Spirit to have the mind of Christ. We need to allow Him to work in our lives. It's, it's a failure to understand the focus of of the New Testament in regard to the Holy Spirit that has led to all the strange stuff that we witness in certain circles regarding the Holy Spirit. It's a failure to understand the New Testament focus on the, on the Holy Spirit that has caused this, these, these strange things to happen. The New Testament of the doc, doctrine of the Holy Spirit, again, seems to center on these two verses here. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. Jesus has left. I can't be here with you. But, I've, but I'm taking care of that. You each have me in, in you by the Holy Spirit, by the Spirit of God. I won't leave you as orphans. I will come to you, he said. This is how, he, he's come, that, this is how that has come to pass. I've thought about this. I've thought about this in my own life. There is no way, not that I've arrived or anything, folks, but there's no way that I can think the way I do, that I can feel the way I do, that I can understand when I am wrong the way I do, except by the Spirit of God. 
There is so much in me that has changed, and it is by the Holy Spirit of God dwelling in me through faith in Jesus Christ that's happened. And if you think I'm a mess now, just, just think about me where before I came to Jesus. The Holy Spirit's got his work cut out yet. I haven't arrived. I, I admit that. But I think about myself, and I understand those, those thoughts that I used to have. And I even understand the, the thoughts that I have now. And I understand that those thoughts get kept at bay. because They don't come become actions anymore because of the work of the Holy Spirit in my life. My desire to live a better life in the name of Jesus. You know, I, I want to experience the fullness of God in the land of the living. And it takes me to submit to God Almighty, the Holy Spirit, and the Word of God for that to come to pass. We have a choice in this. We have a responsibility in this. And again, in, in 16, 14, he will glorify me for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Jesus says, I got all this stuff I want to share with you. The Holy Spirit's going to come and reveal it to you at the proper time. As you grow and you mature in the things of the Lord, as you seek after me, you're going to find me. You're going to have a, a, a deeper understanding of me. You're going to know me better. That's what he's saying to us here. The Holy Spirit is our companion, our guide, our teacher. He is the agent of all communication to and from God. This is the, the, this is the Spirit that dwells within you, friends. He is all the things, the Holy Spirit is all the things that the Bible teaches about God. These are true of the Holy Spirit. As I close this morning, I ask the question, just to kind of reinforce what's been said here this morning. How is it that the, the stay-at-home mom or dad and the seminary scholar are both able to understand God? It's the Holy Spirit. I'm not taking anything away from, from, from learned men. Praise God for them. They write us some fantastic things to take uh, to help that we can use to help take us deeper. I'm, that's not what this is about. But we can go with God as, as, as deep as we each want to. People question, you know, well, well, how do you how do you know you're right about all of this? Well, among many other things, infallible proofs, the Holy Spirit shows Himself to be faithful in all these things. That this, that this actually fans out. This actually works. There's no contradictions here. There's, there's nothing, and, 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 and you know, there, there more and more we see empirical evidence, empirical evidence of it being true. But the Holy Spirit affirms it in our heart. This, this is in fact truth. This is in fact wisdom from God. And the Holy Spirit reveals these things to us through the scriptures. The Holy Spirit is our guide and our teacher. He is not a toy to be played with. We are Pentecostal people here, and we invite the Holy Spirit to come. We embrace the speaking of tongues, the manifestations of the Spirit. But at the same time, the Holy Spirit is, is not something to be toyed with. If the, if the Holy Spirit has spoken to you about Gifts, spiritual gifts, by all means, let's, let's encourage that in you. Whether it's the gift of healing or prophecy, or maybe he's still developing in you, you know, tongues and interpretations. Don't let those things grow dormant. I want to encourage you in that this morning, and we'll work with you on that, allow you to, to, to uh, uh, flow in that. We want to encourage that. Let's just say that now. We want the Holy Spirit to come and manifest his presence in, in, in this place in very real and tangible ways. According to Scripture. <laughs> According to Scripture. And again, understanding God's truth does not depend on our intellectual ability or how many theological degrees we've earned. Rather, God's truth is revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. In fact, there's a vast wealth of wisdom sealed off to everybody except the Christian. That's what Paul was saying to us earlier, that, that they can't understand the things of God. Other if they, if they understood the wisdom of God, they wouldn't have murdered Jesus. 
But they didn't understand that. And that same wisdom is sealed off to those who are rejecting Jesus. That's evidence of it. That's evidence of it. That they, will, they reject Jesus and they don't, they don't get the wisdom. I know I'm starting to sound a little Calvinistic here and I don't want to go there and I'm not. But there's some paradoxes, some things that I don't understand about all this either. All I know for sure is that whoever shall believe on the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. That it's a work of God from beginning to end. And you have your part in it, whether to accept Jesus or reject Jesus. Praise God, and so do I. <laughs> so as a believer, as a follower of Jesus, you are able to acquire the wisdom of God. You are able to acquire, to have the light of God shining, not just in you, but shining from you. You know, I, I talked to a, 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 an older gentleman a couple of weeks ago, and he was referring to one of his students, and he said, I, I laid eyes on him for the first time, and I seen the light of the Lord emanating from this boy. And I, and, I, and I said to him, you know the Lord, don't you? You love the Lord, don't you? And he said, yes. That was, that, 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 that was the light of the Lord shining from that young man. And praise God, let's hope that that light is shining from you and I, that we wouldn't do anything to hinder that, 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 that through submitting ourselves to the word of God and the leading of the Holy Spirit, that that light begins to, to shine a little brighter, not only in us, but through us. But again, it's up to us to allow the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit to take place in our lives. Psalms 32 and 9 says this to us. Write this, make this reference. Psalms 32 and 9, where the, where the psalmist writes, Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with bit and bridle, or else they will not come near you. It's the Lord saying, Don't make me, don't make me throw a, a noose around your neck and drag you down the street. I'm not going to do it. And the psalmist is saying the same thing. Don't be like that. Don't, don't be like that, that, that beast that has no understanding. Come to me. Draw near me and I will draw near to you. And so what I ask this morning is for you who's on the fence with the Lord and for you that's been walking with him for, for, for ages, what is it going to take for you to submit to the, to the leading of the Holy Spirit in your life? When are you just going to say yes to Jesus and give him complete lordship over your life, come what may, and for us other believers who's been down the road a little while, when are we going to stop keeping it to ourselves? And when are we going to submit ourselves completely to the leading of the Holy Spirit? When are we going to submit ourselves completely to the Word of God? When are we going to stop glossing over those hard sections of Scripture that are so convicting to us that they, that's, that's just rough and that couldn't have anything to do with me? You know, they, the, the followers of Jesus said the same thing. This is a hard saying. Who can do it? You can do it. And I can do it. If we're willing to submit to God when we allow our spirit person to be the leader of our life and rather than our flesh person. And boy, that's, that's a job, isn't it? Because we live in this bag. And, and, and Paul, Paul, you know, shared, shared our, 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 our battle. What I know I'm supposed to do, I don't do. And what I don't want to do, I do. What a wretched man I am. But praise God for the grace of Jesus Christ in my life. Amen. I know I didn't quote that just right, but you know the scripture. And so don't let, don't let guilt and frustration take root in your hearts today because that's a work of the enemy. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None. But there's more of God for you. There's more that he, he wants you to experience with him. There's, more there's a deeper relationship and a more personal and intimate relationship he wants you to enjoy with him. Do, do, are we any less saved if we don't take him up on this offer? No. 
but the offer is there all the same and he loves us and he wants to enrich us and allow us to experience him in all of his fullness. And I want to encourage you with that this morning. Would you stand with me and let's pray. TK, could you come and just do a couple of choruses of Holy Spirit, you're welcome here? Just a couple. I want you to just take this, this moment and let God the Holy Spirit just kind of rest on you and allow Him to speak to you. I trust it's going to be words of encouragement. Words of love, maybe even affirmation this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know that some of us in this room need a little peace. Some of us in this room need a little rest from the vigor, vigor what's the word I want? The vigorousness of life. We're always busy, always going, always planning. What am I going to do tomorrow? And it's not that these aren't legitimate concerns. It's not that none of this is real and it should, it, it, but there's no peace in there. There's no, there's no oasis for you. No place that you can retreat to to say, okay, that, those are a matter of fact and those things trouble me, but I'm retreating back to, to God. I'm, re I'm retreating back into his presence and I'm going to enjoy some peace here. I'm going to be anxious through for nothing. 
but through prayer and supplication, I'm going to make all my requests known to you, O God. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding is going to guard my heart and mind in Jesus Christ. That's a very real place. That's the very real place that is available to the believer. Believer, if you haven't, if it's been a while since you've been in that place, the door is wide open this morning for that. And again, those of you who are struggling that are on the fence, Jesus Christ says, I stand at the door and knock. I'm knocking on the door. And the handle's only on one side, on your side. You've got to open the door or I can't come in. And that's even true of us in areas of our lives, friends, that we can lock Jesus out of areas of our lives. Don't do that. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you and we praise you. Holy Spirit, thank you for your presence in this place. We trust that you've met us right where we're at this morning, Lord. I trust that you've met everybody right where they're at this morning. The rest is up to them, whether or not they're going to receive of you or not. I trust that they will. Because you're good and you're a gracious God. Why wouldn't they? Hallelujah. So, Lord, as always, I just pray over this, this congregation. I pray that you turn your face to them. Be gracious to them and give them peace. Give them protection. Provide for their every need. May your presence and your peace rest upon their homes and continually in their lives. And we pray all this in the name of Christ Jesus. And everybody said, amen. God bless you all. And thanks for being here today.